Thank you, Trailer Told. Let's start now. Welcome everyone to a playthrough of the Titan Quest 2 Gamescom demo. With the developers at Grimlore, my name's Balint Martin, I'm the lead systems designer. And I'm uh, Florian Jonas, uh, some of you may know me as the white t-shirt guy, but I'm actually the technical art director here at Grimlore Games. Two roles in one, excellent. So this is basically a live playthrough I'm actually playing right now, um, where we've got a lot to share. About the world of Titan Quest 2, which is obviously set in Greek mythology. We're keeping this whole theme of it being this bright and vibrant place. Somewhere where you'd want to take a holiday, but maybe you wouldn't want to take a holiday with all the monsters around. Yeah, that's definitely right. And um, the Gamescom demo actually starts a bit after the intro chapter, which also will be part of Early Access, where we will uh, learn that, uh, yeah, Nemesis is after us, and now we as a player who barely escaped her uh, have now to find out, like, why is the goddess Nemesis after us, and uh, who better to ask than the Moirai, the three fates of Greek mythology. That's right. To get access to them, we will have to find a god, but first it would help to find some kind of village, people that can guide us. So that's what we're doing right now. Here on the beach, there's a bunch of crabs. They're kind of bad from Titan Quest 1, but in some different ways. As well as the Ichthians. Here's the first one. What generally can be said about uh, Titan Quest is that we have this handcrafted world, so we don't use any procedural level generation, um, at least for now. And uh, yeah, this allows us to really um, yeah, take um, yeah, advantage of all these little areas that we can design to create uh, memorable uh, memorable uh, yeah, situations for the player, like uh, here this ladder might uh, be missed by a few people, but um, yeah, it actually leads to a, to a little area where the um, player yeah, can face more Ictians and uh, maybe also discovers uh, something else. Yeah, this is Let's also see. pretty early in the game, so you know, the encounters, we've deliberately made them quite easy, but we're still putting some rewards here, as well as some nice view with the waterfall over there. And as yeah, far as exploration goes, more rewards or exploration, but it's optional. You don't have to come here to the Altar of Benevolence. Could have just skipped this. Yeah, we're trying to um, yeah, break up these combat pauses like you saw before when uh, Ballant was running back from the first Ictians to have these little scenic events uh, like the waterfall. That's right. So we've got a bunch of choice dialogues here that we're currently covering up with the camera, but that's fine. Uh, I've requested a staff here and that brings us to our items which we've got a lot of items and they're really cool. Um, not just in terms of visuals, but also in terms of what they do. So we brought back obviously all the things about rarities that you can imagine. Um, they basically come with a different number of affixes, but we also put the items into these families, which are essentially these visual groupings of the items. And then those will also bring a specific effect with them. Uh, the innate effect, the white effect essentially here on the Overview. Uh, Flo, do you want to tell us a little bit about how the visual groupings have been created? Yeah, Even absolutely. Swap the bow. Yeah, so um, as in other uh, games, obviously we have a lot of weapon classes, but all the all these weapon classes like one hand sword, uh, shield, bow, all of these we have divided in uh, three families each, as Balint was mentioning already, and each of these families kind of represent or kind of support uh, a, a playstyle a bit more. I mean, after all, they, they stay uh, the same, so a two-head axe, for example, will always be the slow, heavy-hitting uh, weapon compared to a sword, let's say, but there are nuances that can be shifted with these families. So, for example, for, with, uh, to stay with the example of the two-headed axes, we have uh, heavy, medium, and light axes, and uh, the light axe might be maybe uh, yeah, focusing more on a crit build, while the, uh, yeah, the heavy axes, yeah, more support this really uh, builds that, that just want to bring the damage to, to the enemies. Yeah. And uh, visually, uh, we kind of dis um, differentiate between generated items and uniques or monster frequents or faction items. And uh, so, in the, especially in the early uh, game or in, in, in combat situation, most of the time, if you're not facing unique uh, creatures, you will mostly find these generated uh, items. And uh, for these families, we have multiple uh, modular pieces that kind of get randomized together. So we want to create this random look um, where the where the player can find um, yeah, different looking weapons uh, as often as possible, because we definitely know that uh, loot is a big part of uh, yeah an ARPG, obviously. And um, yeah, so each weapon will consist at least of two parts, but many of uh, of more parts actually as well. Um, and this is not only reflected in the 3D mesh, this is also like, uh, you can find the, you can see the item on the ground, you can see it in the icon, and you can see it on your player character. Um, because I think personally, this is really something that, um, yeah, stands out um, 
for us, and I think it's really rewarding just to to see uh, everything on your character displayed and also in the uh, yeah in the inventory. Yeah, here it is. Like on the ground, it looks exactly the same as it does in the inventory as it does on the icon. And we've just seen some more complex fights here that really brought down my health. I didn't do a very good job of dodging, but uh, you know, you don't need to dodge if you can kite. So there's many, many different varieties of playstyles that we want to allow. Yes, the dodge is a very central skill, but you, do you have to always use it? No, not really, no. Uh, speaking of skills, we're about to level up, and when we do, we'll be talking about the masteries in a moment. But first, it seems these Ictian Guardians have been dropping some special items, and we'll be picking those up. Uh, there's a separate stash here for quest items, so wonder what that could be for. Uh, yeah, while, uh, bring... you, you can maybe... Uh shed some light on what these coins actually do. Uh, the viewers who actually watched out uh, may have seen a bug, actually, because the staff that we mentioned actually doesn't look in-game as it does on the icon. So props for you who found out. Uh, this is actually a bug. Uh, <laughs> sorry that it happened. But we're on to the items. Like, this is a very first iteration, and we have a fix already uh, in an internal build. Um, yeah, just wanted to be sure we're on the same page here. That's right. This build is actually old now, so <laughs> there is that. Uh, we still wanted to show you, for those of you who couldn't attend in person, and that's, I think, uh, totally fine. It is far for some of you, after all. But yeah, we have leveled up, and it's time to talk a little bit about those masteries. So we still have the whole thing of combining two masteries to form your own class. We don't just give you a class. So it's classic Titan Quest stuff. We have active skills as well as passive skills. Of course, what you see here in terms of the size of the skill tree is drastically cut down for the Gamescom demo specifically so that uh, players with their limited time uh, sessions over there uh, could just get into it and figure out what's going on within the skills. So these are the modifiers that you can slot in, uh, which will cost some uh, capacity slots, which then you unlock with your active points. So if I want to modify my Leap Slam now to do more stuff, such as uh, also do a stun, then I can assign this, but uh, that will take two modifier, uh, two of these slots. However, if I take it out, I gain those back. And I can do this anytime. I could assign the Rage Gain, which is also a really nice modifier. And, well, we need to somehow make use of that Rage, right? It's just a status effect. We've got this onslaught on the primary weapon attack, and I have some more points available over there, so why don't we just get that, put it on, and then it can work in tandem with our Frost Explosion, uh, which essentially converts some of our damage to cold, and then causes some explosions when enemies get uh, frozen, which we can very easily do with our Frost Nova as well, Ice Nova, sorry. And the Onslaught, as we gain Rage from every attack, as well as our Leap Slam, will be um, increasing our attack speed, so we're going to be attacking pretty quickly. We also have Overwhelm, which is also a status effect gained by the primary attack. Up to three stacks can be had, and then you consume it, essentially, with your Stomp. The Stomp already stuns, so it's pretty useful, but Overwhelm makes it do more damage and in a larger radius. So let me quickly show you. We're going to build up the three stacks of Overwhelm here, and then consume it with a giant Stomp. Uh, but once this cooldown is over, we'll be able to see how much smaller the regular one is. There you go. Giant size difference. And we also have some passive points, which we'll be wanting to spend here. Now, the passives don't quite have modifiers. They have what we call feats. And the way we have it set up now is that at level 3, you get one slot, and then at level 6, another slot. I just invested here so that we can get the ailment chance to uh, synergize here with our application of chill from our regular weapon attack. We'll put that in, and that will be great overall. And then in Storm... We can uh, diverge a little bit and get a little bit of energy because when I spam my ice shards, I run out of energy. Not great. And I think, uh, but one thing that we could answer uh, that I have been seeing floating around the community is the question: if masteries actually have an effect on the on the modifiers, do masteries bring additional modifiers at all? It's a, it's a one way or the other. Uh, so they don't. We don't do cross mastery modifiers really, but we do these cross mastery effects. So, for example, rage. Uh, could be consumed by something in Storm in the f in the future, or Overwhelm. There's definitely examples for that. So you do have these natural synergies uh, that are going to go across. And you have uh, modifiers injecting themselves into the global abilities at the moment, such as the uh, dodge, such as the regular weapon attack. Right, so I think uh, the Frost Explosion, for example, is a good example for that. That actually, like the Frost Explosion is a skill that takes advantage of the frozen state, uh, especially uh, of, of enemies, and this actually comes from the Storm Mastery, right? 
Yes. Perfect. What happened here? Yes, it just happens to naturally also synergize with what's in in warfare, right? So <laughs> you get you get a lot of double benefits. You get a lot of stick stacking. Uh, definitely worth making use of that. And now that I've reached my high stack count on on rage, you can see how quick the attack speed has become. So it definitely is transformative in that sense. And why am I allowed to make use of warfare skills, but with a staff. I'm kind of setting myself up to be a mage here, aren't I? Well, that is possible because of our attribute system. So our attributes are basically this three directional uh, triangle that you're looking at, but it becomes six directional once you start combining these. We've got vigor in the middle as well, which impacts your health, uh, but might, what that does, it basically unlocks your support for heavy armor as well as heavy weapons that you would expect from a warrior. Knowledge is more the mage stuff, uh, like robes as well as staves. Agility is more like the um, deck stuff that you'd be used to from other RPG games, so daggers and stuff like that. But then we have things like fitness. Fitness looks at a combination, uh, we have a formula for this, for might, vigor, and agility basically get combined into fitness, um, depending on how you spread this out. Might and agility contribute more than vigor, but what this does is strike damage and pierce damage gets increased by fitness, and then resolve the combination of might, vigor, and knowledge, that will give you fire and cold damage. And we have a lot of uh, that right now as well as fitness, but because we are an ice warrior, we kind of want to... a storm warrior, we kind of want to go into resolve here to play into cold damage. That's what we have a lot of right now, so um, we could go more into might and support our heavy armor now and still be a mage in terms of damage, but have the option to swap to pure physical. Flexibility, choice, choice, choice. That's the motto here. So if at some point we find a cool uh, melee weapon, for example, we could switch out that staff. Uh, yeah, just for a melee weapon and that would just work uh, just like the staff in the, in the build, right? Mm -hmm. We will at some point definitely swap for something. Uh, we do want to show off the stuff after all. Uh, the teleporters, it will come in very useful momentarily. Uh, unfortunately, we have some issues with the ranged mechanics still. As you saw, some projectiles were uh, missing. So what I'll do is, at the first opportunity, we will be swapping to uh, something with melee. Maybe we get to show dual wield as the enemies drop stuff. But yeah, it's not always bright and pretty in Greece over here. We've got the caves. It's going to be kind of chock full of spiders, as well as uh, skellies. Stuff like that you can totally expect. We don't shy away from the ARPG staples, but we're definitely uh, in a brighter spot than uh, most of the competition would be. Maybe I can uh, quickly say something about the Ragdoll, because I saw that also in the comments. Um, I think people were complaining a bit, in, rightfully so, in the trailer that uh, the there was a bit lack of, of Ragdoll uh, physics, although it was already enabled, we didn't make it in time uh, for the trailer. We definitely amped it up for the uh, for the games conversion, though. Um, and we also um, yeah invested a, a bit more into that system. So the Ragdoll impact is a pure visual thing, right? But the, if the death blow, uh, which triggers the Ragdoll, is now actually um, yeah a bit um, yeah, adjustable, so each skill and also each weapon will have a different impact on how far the enemies will actually be flung. So if you kill somebody with a two-hand axe or a heavy warfare uh, uh, skill, the definitely you will definitely send the uh, spiders flying. Um, although, uh, yeah, just a death blow with a dagger, for example, will not have the same impact. That's right. So we've got these exploding spiders, which you would have to basically avoid. They get a lot more interesting when they're combined with others. Obviously, one-on-one, -on -one, not a huge threat. But uh, we do want to go for this more complex fighting situation. Like here, if I let myself get caught by that web, I get slowed down. And I happen to take some of the explosion damage from the spider, but not the damage over time area. If I take both, uh, my health would have been down to like half or so. If there's multiple of those exploded spiders, I'd probably be dead. Now, this is also a tougher encounter, however, here with the uh, Revenant. It's able to cast these long line AoEs. And it also empowers the nearby skeletons. So you, you get frozen by this. I tried to chuck my potion in the last second, wasn't enough, and I'm toast. But um, guess what happens then? We go back all the way here, uh, but we don't want to be, you know, masochist or turn you into that. Uh, we do offer you this recovery portal to go back. You don't have to kill everything on the way. In fact, everything you did kill is still toast. Um, so we'll be able to just head back to the recovery portal. And the fight is back. We have to solve this combat puzzle that we've set up for you. Shouldn't be a big deal if you pay attention, if you dodge these big abilities. 
And if you focus down the enemies, especially if you have kiting, um, this is a pretty easy encounter still, but we did want to show you what happens. Yeah. So we definitely want to take you also as a player series and create challenges uh, that you just can't breeze through from time to time at least. I mean, we definitely are a true RPG, I want to say, um, but we also want to uh, have you fun right from the get-go and not only after the first playthrough, right? Um, still, we want to respect your time and uh, definitely want to, to, don't want to make it tedious, uh, which is why we uh, yeah, went for that Death Portal uh, solution. Yes, and if you die, you do lose a little bit of experience, so there is a penalty. Uh, we'll look into perhaps giving you an option to get that back, um, like in like it was in Titan Quest One with the uh, with the with the great stone. stones. Mm -hmm. So that is something we're looking into still. Probably sometimes during the early access, we'll have our answer regarding that. Anyway, I leveled up again. What do we do next, Flo? Um, I finished this I first. So yeah, that sounds good. Energy. Maybe we can show the frost shots. Yeah, yeah that's 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 probably a good idea. We can respec um, at least a little bit. Let's get the maximum energy or the regen. I think the regen. The regen is good. Yeah, that's probably going to allow us to be smooth there. So the current thing that's applied to ice shards, current modifier, is the torrent, which gives us additional projectiles. That's pretty much a no-brainer, right? Like, you probably want to go with this first. Um, but there's other options. There's this one that uh, allows you to penetrate further enemies. However, to get to level 6 would require 4 points, and we have 3 right now. So I think we're going to start here with long shot which just requires one, and we'll just spend these points and wait for the sixth one, and then we'll swap them out later at the next so level up. Yeah, so you can this. already also see uh, that the capacity cost may differ on the complexity of the modifier, so it's not always a given that you can slot every modifier that you want. Uh, it, um, there will definitely be super exp uh, expensive ones, uh, which really will make you have to think about uh, what modifiers you actually slot in. Yeah, they're but a little bit better. If, if I shoot from a longer range, they're going to be stronger now, so that's, I think, very visible here. This should have been a more complex encounter, but we're just a little bit too strong for this. So, again, the early parts of the game are a little bit easier uh, as this area that we're showing off, but we'll shortly ramp up the difficulty a little bit. And to go back to the semi-open world approach, we do want to reward exploration. So this lady over there, uh, not very happy to see us, because we should be over there. <laughs> but she's pointing us out to this chest down there. There should be some useful loot. I'll make use of that. Now, because of the ranged issues, I'll be swapping back to Spear and Shield for the moment, and hopefully we get some decent drops. Um, this is not scripted, so not everything will go well for me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's actually a good uh, point, um, time value that we talk about the enemy classes, right? Uh, we have seen this faction system, and you have seen plenty of the Ictins by now. Um, but uh, here we also start to introduce more uh, classes to make the combat encounters a bit more complex and more interesting. Um, so. What you have to think of factions is like a toolbox for our game designers to play with to create these encounters. So we have guards that tank damage and try to uh, keep you away from the casters. Then the casters themselves that either uh, yeah deal high damage or yeah assist. Um, also we have the crowd and en um, enemies like the troopers here and the brute that you can see here in the middle with a big club uh, where you definitely want to stay away from. As you yeah. can see, they re he really can dish out damage. And if you like. Again, by himself, he might not be the, the biggest threat, but imagine you were stunned by one of the guards who have a shield um, and are surrounded maybe by a few others, then this really becomes an issue. That's absolutely right. And, you know, we've seen earlier the man catcher, the guy with the giant halberd, as well as his uh, net that he can throw. So he can net you, and then the brute comes in, he slams on the ground. It's also a very powerful um, ability that you have to be very off and... You know, we, we just really want to demand a little bit of attention, a little bit of uh, creativity to solve these combat encounters. But again, early on, we're still simple. Later on, we will start mixing these more advanced creatures together. And actually, we'll get to show that later in the demo as well here. Uh, so I've got a... Is this a dagger? That means we can have two. Uh, but I need to click on the shield to remove that. We have inventory sorting, of course, by the way. And we have a ton of stats for you to enjoy. Uh, this is just a basic overview but we'll have a lot of advanced stats, and I mean a lot. Now, you can see a lot of these are still under construction, uh, but these are, uh, at the base level, all the stats that we'll provide for you, and we'll try to make sure that they're very clear. We're still working on the tooltips for them, uh, but we'll make sure that it's easy to understand. Now, why did I go double daggers? So the reason it's interesting is because they have a lot of single target damage. So if I come across some tough enemies, I'll be able to just shank them, and they'll very quickly disappear. But... These basic weapons, these smaller weapons, they don't have a big area of effect. All the weapons have an area of effect in Titan Quest 2, but their shape and size differs. So it's a tiny cone with these. 
But you get this crazy attack speed, especially once your uh, rage goes up with our current setup. Nemesis. This sorry The god Glaucos has a temple near here. And if you're lucky, lucky we maybe find later, uh, yeah, um, the, the Raging Bull who makes a reappearance. Uh, it, I, I read it somewhere uh, in the community uh, that they were afraid that we have this pre-placed loot everywhere. Uh, this is definitely not the case. Uh, it's just as uh, some were already mentioning uh, a setup for the demo build, so we can actually yeah, reward the, the players of the demo. Um, yeah, but, it's and, definitely not the case in the real game. So the demo, yes, we did want to show that one item. Uh, but otherwise, everything is randomized. So you still have to yeah. farm <laughs> long term. And we'll provide okay. you great options to do so. Now, crafting isn't going to be present immediately in uh, the beginning of the early access, but we do plan to add it. And we'll make the monsters drop their uh, monster specific loot rather than the human loot that you're currently going to see from them, especially animals like crabs or whatever. Oh, just because uh, I saw you picking up gold, I saw that also uh, been uh, something that people, yeah, uh, were robbed the wrong way uh, by. This is also something that we actually already, yeah, have in the local build here, the auto pickup of gold. So we are also thinking of quality of life features, although it's early access. There's tons of these little side areas that you can explore and farm for XP. Like coming here to just go after the spiders, once we add crafting, this is going to be a lot more meaningful than it is in now, uh, this current example. But, you know, roaming around here, there's a lot of spiders. So if we do something crafting related with spiders, this is a decent place to go. And there will be uh, teleporters nearby as well. There it is. Just walk past it. And we're, oh, I guess one more area that we can very briefly show is this uh, little farm spot with the boars and the birds. Should be familiar from Titan Quest 1. Uh, very hard to see the boars in the tall grass, so they pose a little bit of challenge. Might be surprising you every now and then. And of course, there's a big boy. Definitely. I'll let him do his ability. Oh god, that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Big stomp. You definitely want to walk out of that. Yeah, I was told that actually uh, boars uh, played a very big role in Greek uh, mythology. And uh, yeah, I mean, by the size of it, I can definitely see how they pose the threat. Uh, <laughs> if I see a three meter boar, then I would also <laughs> <laughs> try to use both my masteries, <laughs> running and hiding. <laughs> of course, we've got side quests as well. Oh, that's a nice load of items. Uh, we even have a side fear somewhere. Um, so we have two handed items, of course, uh, for warrior types, but scythes are actually light two-handed items, so a mage type could technically wear this if it was the right type. Now, this is um, not really uh, lending itself to a mage, but if it ha had, let's say, a fire version of that or a cold version of that, that could totally happen. Uh, we'd also be uh, making sure to cover it on the item, such as with this one, uh, where, you know, the fire staff is on fire, Well, we have that for the physical weapons as well. I think one, one thing I quickly want to note here is we also have like uh, these damage conversions, obviously, um, and we also reflect that uh, on the projectiles and the, and the weapons. So it's not only uh, like if you have like this uh, one skill that kind of converts your damage into fro uh, frost damage, then you will also be shooting fro uh, frost projectiles and not only fire projectiles that deal frost damage technically. So we really uh, want to show as much of the gameplay systems uh, on the yeah, on the player facing side. Yes, those those kinds of weapons are not particularly going to be common, by the way. Um, so we know like a sword on fire obviously is a little special, but it's not going to be yeah. a unique, unlike that one. Uh, there's a raging <laughs> bull. We place this here on purpose with a very high chance to spawn, um, just so that we can show it off. And um, I'm just going to make sure I don't have any extra points to spend, but I don't right now, so that's great. Um, what the raging bull does is it makes your rage stacks essentially better, uh, giving you more weapon damage for them. Um, so with, with epic and legendary items, we'll be handcrafting the precise effects that the weapon will wield. It's not really randomized at this point, um, but depending on where you find them, they will have a different level to them, which is true of every item, by the way, but also for these unique items that we handcraft rather than the random affixes that you get from the other stuff. So why is that important? It's important because you will want to get loot that is close to your level. Um, basically, ensure that you get to grow like that as a character, that you get to progress. And it will give you ways to change the difficulty of the world as well, through rituals. You'll either be able to just increase them flat out in the entire world, or you'll be able to raise the minimum to your own level as well. Which is going to be great to go back to older areas to, to farm there, find items that are specific to the Ictians, 
But eventually you'll be getting out of the area where, where the Ictians are. Uh, so one day you will not have access to the Ictian stuff, and that's Ooh. why the big encounters are hard. <laughs> 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 yes, one. so all these uh, tougher, higher tier enemies working together using their abilities is uh, definitely commanding some attention, and I'm talking at the same time now. Not the easiest thing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can do some talking then. Yes. Uh, so it's not mentioned. Uh, this is actually a side quest here. So the uh, uh, guy out of, outside of the cave was crying for help because his sister was kidnapped by uh, Ictians, and uh, yeah, they are held in this cave. Uh, this is all content that could have been missed if uh, you don't pay attention to the world. I mean, um, not everybody uh, will want to do all the exploration, but those who uh, yeah are interested in that, um, yeah, we will also cater for. And we actually have also a, a small riddle here in this cave. So not only can we free the uh, the villagers that were kidnapped, but we can also, um, yeah, find a little extra layer um, if we actually, yeah, again, take a look at the uh, world and, um, yeah, are on the lookout for little things that stand out. Although I have to say, like, these riddles Ooh. aren't... Oh, nice, okay. Um, these riddles aren't super, super demanding, so it's no point to click adventure, right? It's most of the time just finding the odd uh, one or, um, yeah, clicking something in a specific order. Yes, I did want to stop real quick to talk about that encounter that we just had. So, the enchanter was empowering our man catcher, making him stronger overall, faster as well. And he used his ability to snare on me, which also made him faster and stronger. So, that inherently <laughs> synergizes with itself, with just two characters getting added uh, to an encounter. And the obvious counter to this is to somehow stun or freeze or whatever, do some status effect on the mage, right? So that it can no longer do the boosting and the healing. Um, taking that out is quick enough, but then still you get chased by the man catcher. And then I was skirting around it, making sure to dodge every single attack by just sidestepping. We really want to make sure that the combat is smooth and responsive like that, so that you can really express your skill if you wish. But most of the time, you won't have to do that. But with a very flimsy character uh, that dies easily, uh, a glass cannon, you would probably want to consider it. Now, we've also picked up this monster infrequent item, uh, the Ictian Sword, which has built-in poison damage in the base damage already. So this is what we mean, actually, when it comes to... Oops, let me just equip that. Yeah, you, you, can, you can visibly see that this is, in fact, a poison sword. It does poison damage. It's built into the base, not just through affixes, but affixes can also add further to it. Also, in its innate properties, it has four cold and poison damage, and gives you some poison resistance. So uh, definitely a pretty decent monster and frequent. If I had two of them and if I had some uh, uh, cunning, I would probably be building this. But for now, I think our build is best for the Raging Bull. So that's how we'll continue. At last, the horrible fishmen have had us penned in like sheep. Can you imagine? We also want to add some character to our NPCs, of course. Uh, this is part of the puzzle, um, but what I'm doing ain't it. We're going to find out what it actually wants from us. Right, and since you mentioned uh, Monster Infrequence, um, obviously uh, we are aware of the uh, Tide Quest 1. Uh, you loot what you you can see, what you can, uh, you can get, what you see uh, system. Um, but uh, yeah, that's something that we want to get in some form back. But uh, currently we only do that by, um, yeah, loot lists that are fitting to, to the enemy. Um, we are looking throughout early access into ways to, uh, yeah, bring that back though. I think I'm about to level up here. There we go. One more level up before the big encounter. Uh, so we were talking about how we're going to use ice shards. Let's do it. Projectile penetration, so it goes through multiple nice. enemies. And I still have two more. <laughs> we can put this back, actually. We can keep the long shot. All right, this is pretty nice. And then um, we could get even more energy and regeneration as well. Which, by the way, you can also see if you hover over this globe. We have 34 energy regen. That's a lot. Pretty good stuff. And as you saw before, uh, Violet was lighting up the uh, brazier uh, up north. So this is a uh, one, two, three puzzle where you just need to, yeah, click the, the increasing number of, of braziers. Yeah, we're not going to do brain-breaking puzzles, but we do want to reward your efforts for exploration and looking around caves and stuff like that. Um, so, it, yeah, it's not about complexity. It's about just seeing what's out there. Exactly. And I think this goes really well with the handcrafted one, so I think the level and content designers really did a great job in that regard. I'm probably not going to pick those up. Our inventory is about to be full. <laughs> of course, there will be vendors. Not in this demo, but uh, we are making them. We have them working locally. You can't hide in here. 
Yeah, so we just met that guy and he's uh, apparently hiding in this cave and hopes that the Ictins won't fight him. Sorry, it's, it's, it's his bot. We really shouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right, let's see it if we get so some crazy. good loot for the final fight here in the cave. Uh, we're not really going to need the movement speed, so I think I'll take this cast speed stuff. Mm -hmm. It's going to come in useful for our ice shards. Uh, blah, blah. What else do we have? This gives us some cool damage. I guess we can go for that. I mean, that's with the ice shards. And there's a surprise bunch of skellies. And that is actually not a boss over there. The skeleton warlock is what we call a leader. Uh, so what that means is he's the top echelon within uh, the skeleton faction. And I just got frozen by uh, these guys dealing cold damage. That's also attributed to the Frost Revenant. But that's not the only guy with the aura here. Actually, the warlock has an aura and gives these guys life leeching damage. So definitely gotta take out the light guys first, then the support. And then go after the big man himself. Again, trying to dodge these individual abilities so that we don't get blasted into smithereens. Might be easier to do with our ranged attacks. He's immune, by the way, to freezing and all that. That's why I didn't really use that here. Yeah, as you can see, it's a back and forth, slower but more engaging fight than you might be used to from other ARPGs. And our bosses will follow some of the same principles, uh, but the leader's job is to work together with a core faction like the Skeletons. We will have several uh, factions as well, like the Ictians that you've seen. We will have bandits that you have not seen. We'll have wildlife that you have seen, but they aren't working quite like the others. They're more scattered and just uh, doing their own thing. We will have bosses, however, and the bosses will be those 1v1 encounters that uh, are going to take a longer time, definitely set up for the dual experience and with more complex mechanics and skills. Yeah, and for the initial early access, we planned with uh, with three bosses, um, and I definitely wanted to um, yeah clear something up when we are talking about the initial early access. Then this is the first launch version that we will bring out uh, in win in winter. Um, this, we will follow up this with updates that also extend the content. So we, when we are saying uh, we're planning with around about 12 hours for a completionist playthrough, this is, means the 12 hours for the initial uh, release. Um, this will extend, be extended by the follow-up updates, uh, which will bring new chapters, new masteries, uh, more content, more weapons, more loot, more of everything. That's right, and that's all included in your purchase. So there's plenty to still create. Uh, we mm -hmm. are actually planning and building those new chapters as we speak. And um, there will be more enemies, there will be more loot, there will be more masteries as well. At least three masteries in this very initial drop. And then we'll do even more. And expand on what is there. Exactly. And so I want to say that we have a great uh, start, a good especially toolbox. Like it's always hard in game development to get all these systems in place so you can actually start uh, building the world because that needs a lot of fine tuning. And uh, yeah, the systems need to work together and everything. And I think we are in a very good state regarding that. Um, and as Balin said, we all are already working on the updates. There is still uh, room though. So we definitely want to hear your feedback. And as you yeah, may have noticed, we definitely follow the discussion. Uh, definitely are talking about uh, the feedback we are, we are reading uh, and bring that to the team as well so yeah i think this is really what we would love to get from the early access as well um to hear your opinion and so you are also able to to shape the development um to some degree indeed and look it's night we have a day night system right also with that i guess we are we've told you everything we have to say for now but there will be more so stay tuned there will be blog posts and all that kind of stuff so we'll wish you a good night with that awesome take care and bye 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 bye